warm welcome, everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to announce this next talk, which is going to be called Sick Over an Alpha, where Cho Yun Park and Min Cho Sun are going to be talking about um, signal overshadowing attacks in LTE. The two of them uh, are researchers at the KIST in Korea, the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. And um, I'm really interested in hearing about the exploits these two found. Please give them a huge warm welcome with an applause. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to our talk. The name is Sigover plus Alpha. What we are talking about is very interesting, realistic, and a new attack in LTE. My name is Mincher. I'm a graduate student at System Security Lab in KAIST. My research interest is in cellular networks and comparison analysis. Hi, my name is Chol Jun, and I'm also a PhD student in security, System Security Lab in KAIST. My research interest is also cellular network system and mobile security uh, analysis. In this presentation, uh, we prepared a lot of interesting attack demo videos. And Minchol will talk about the first half of the presentation, about some introductions on LTE network and concepts on Seagover attack and broadcasting message injection using Seagover. Then I will talk about the rest part of the presentation about a little more advanced attack. OK, let's start. First of all, what I'm going to talk about is the cellular network. All of us use a cell phone for voice call, playing games, or watching a video in anywhere at any time. And the mobile phone has been developed from first generation to first generation, as shown in the figure on the right. And five, fifth generation service is now started. Today, we are going to talk about new and powerful attack techniques that can be used for attacks in LTE. Also, we will explain some examples of attacks and show demonstration of them. To understand the main content, we need a background for LTE. The LTE system is largely composed of a UE, such as a smartphone used by a user for LTE service, and a base station in charge of transmitting and receiving radio signals, and a core network for the mobility management, authentication, and data servers of the user. For control messages, such as radio connection, the UE and base station use RRC protocols. Similarly, the UE and the core network send and receive control messages with NAS protocols. The main parts of our talk are the UE and the base station. If so, how does the UE establish a radio connection with the base station and use the LTE service? First, the UE has to decide which base station to connect to. To do this, UE scans the LTE frequency band and selects the most stable base station by considering the frequency priority and signal strength of the base station. After selecting one base station, the UE starts attach procedure with the base station. First, the UE receives a PSS and SSS signal sent by the base station. In turn, MIB and SIB are decoded. All three messages are broadcast messages sent by the base station. They are used to match time synchronization, to know bandwidth or transmission scheme, and to know information about the base station. After broadcast message, the UE establishes a radio connection with the base station. This process is done using the RRC protocol messages, after which the UE proceeds with circuit setup for NAS protocol. Through this process, the UE and the core network share the key and algorithm for encryption and integrity check. 
The secret setup process is also performed between the UE and the base station. After this series of procedures, the UE can attach successfully and use the LTE service. And then, what attack is possible against the UE connected to the network and using the service? The most widely used method so far is to use a fake base station. An attacker could use a fake base station that behaves like a legitimate base station causing the victim UE to disconnect from the legitimate base station and connect to the fake base station. This is possible because the UE preferentially tries to connect to a strong base station. Several attacks using FPS have been introduced, including man-in-the-middle attack, denial of services, user identity leak, and fake emergency alert, and so on. As such, the fake base station attack using the characteristics of the radio communication is actively used for research or actual attack. And then, here is the questions. Is FVS attack is the, the only attack method using the characteristics of LT radio connection? Or should victim UEs always be connected to the FVS for wireless attacks? The answer is no. There is more intuitive and powerful attack method than FVS. It is a signal overshadowing attack. While the previous FVS attack used the characteristic of selecting a stronger signal base station, the SIG over attacks uses the characteristic of wireless communication to decode the stronger signal when different signals are transmitted at the same frequency. This is illustrated by the figure below. The normal base station continuously transmits LTE signals in time and frequency. The UE then receives and decodes the, this signal. If the attacker can match the time and frequency exactly with the normal signal and transmit a stronger signal than normal signal, the UE will decode the stronger signal. This is the signal overshadowing attack that overrides the LTE signal. If the SIG over attack is possible, then what message can be used to overwrite? The message is we can overwrite our DOS with no security protection. First, there is a broadcast message. The broadcast message is a base station sent signal for all users with no consideration for encryption and integrity checks in the LTE specification. Second, there is a message that can be used for an attack because it is unprotected among messages transmitted only to a specific user, not a broadcast message. One reason that is not protected is a bug in the UE implementation. The other is that there are several messages in the specification that allow plain messages before performing security setup. The details of the SIG over attack will be discussed one by one. First, I will explain what to solve in order to perform the SIG over attack, and how the SIG over attack is different from the existing FPS attack, and what kinds of attacks are possible using broadcast messages and SIG over. Lastly, Churchill will explain attacks using unicast messages, and then discuss something like countermeasure and future works. So first, there are some challenges and questions for SIG over attack. First, we should consider which part of the signal we overwrite. If too many signals are overwritten, the UE will not receive normal signals, causing only those effects such as jamming. On the contrary, if too few signals are covered, the difficulty of the attack increases and the UE may not be able to decode properly. 
The second challenge is how to synchronize time and frequency. This is the most important challenge in SIG over attack, where the attack signal must be accurately overwrite on the signal of the normal base station. Finally, how much error is OK? Even if the signal is transmitted like a normal base station, there may be a slight error in time or frequency. Therefore, it is necessary to know how much accuracy is required for the UE to properly decode the signal. I will explain the details of these three challenges and questions. To answer about the first question, let's look at the LTE frame structure first. A LTE frame consists of multiple subframes, and a subframe has multiple symbols, and a message is included in a subframe meaning that there are various options to be overshadowed. Symbol level overshadowing requires precise synchronization, so success rate is hard to guarantee. On the other hand, frame level overshadowing requires to rewrite multiple subframes or multiple messages. It can also affect other normal messages. So it is quite natural to overshadow in the subframe level. Next, let's look at time synchronization first among synchronization issues. Attackers subframe and legitimate subframe must arrive at the UE simultaneously. In order to overwrite a particular subframe accurately, for simplicity, let's assume there is no propagation delay for now. The attacker utilizes synchronization signal called PSS and SSS to get accurate time synchronization as they are sent periodically from the legitimate base station. More concretely, first, the attacker is to PSS, SSS to get frame timing of legitimate base station, meaning that the attacker can identify the frame timing T0, T1, and T2. Second, once the attacker learns the timing, she can predict the timing of the target subframe. Since each subframe has fixed size, which is one millisecond. For example, if the attacker overshadows second subframe of frame 566, then she can transmit the malicious subframe at T2 plus one millisecond. Now, the attacker signal arrives at the UE simultaneously, since we assume that there is no propagation delay. However, in real life, there is propagation delay depending on the location, meaning that T0 will be delayed due to the propagation delay of PSS and SSS. Also, if the attacker is located far from the UE, more delay would be added. The delay could be compensated if the attacker precisely locates the UE and the base station, but it is not realistic in the wild. The delay is up to some maximum value because they are located within range of the base station. So, in practice, there is a delay that cannot be compensated. So, subframes cannot be aligned exactly. So, then we can count on the LTUE. LTE is designed to be reliable, especially in outdoor environment. In outdoor, UE can move with using pawn, also there is a reflex effect because of buildings. So we expected that the UE would compensate such small errors if the subframe is somewhat synchronized, but not exactly. So the question is, how much can the UE tolerate this delay error? Since it is chipset dependent, we measure the max delay tolerance of two cut smartphones. And result is around 12 and 11 microseconds each. And both result exceeds max delay of the urban base station, which is around 8 microseconds. So this means that the attack can succeed regardless of the location of the base station and the victim use. In summary, the attacker can be anywhere 
within the range of the base station to succeed the attack. <coughs> the last one to solve is frequency synchronization. LTE standard specifies the minimum frequency accuracy that LTE base station must have as 50 ppb. So for, for precise synchronization, the attacker needs to use a sufficiently accurate frequency. After that, residual frequency error can be compensated by CFO correction algorithm. Since the SIGOVER was run on a typical SDR equipped with an accurate oscillator, we adopt GPSDO to improve its frequency accuracy. GPSDO guarantees 25 ppb accuracy without GPS antenna and 1 ppb with GPS antenna. Lastly, we can compensate residual frequency error by PSS SSS based CFO correction. Here's the summary of the main questions and answers. We overshadow sub subframe units using PSS, SSS4 time synchronization, and using GPSDU and CFO correction for frequency synchronization. Finally, COTS UE is generous enough to cover the entire range of the urban base station. In short, an attacker located on a range of the base station can overshadow broadcast messages to any victim within the base station coverage. Next, before examining the difference between SIGOVER and FPS, I will explain the process of SIGOVER attack. First, the attacker collects necessary values by listening to the broadcast message of the normal base station. This process is necessary because Information about base station is required to disguise the attacker's signal as that of a normal base station. Next, the attacker creates a subframe that contains the message to use for the attack. And now the attack begins. First, the attacker receives the PSS and SSS signals of the normal base station and synchronizes time with the base station. Then send the multiple subframe that she made at the precise timing. Finally, the UE receiving the signal receives a malicious message by decoding the optical subframe stronger than the signal of the normal base station. Here's our test environment to verify the SIGOVER. We implement the SIGOVER by using open source LT stack and we used USR facilities for radio transmission. We also such as iPhone XS or Galaxy S9 to verify this attack. In the remainder of this talk, I will talk about performance of SIGOVER and attacks that can be launched using SIGOVER. OK, so far, I have shown that SIGOVER can be used in practice. But both FPS and SIGOVER can inject malicious broadcast messages to the UEs. So what is the difference between SIGOVER and FPS? Or what is the advantage of SIGOVER? The basic advantage of SIGOVER compared with fake base station comes from the fact that the SIGOVER does not need connection establishment to inject the message. This has multiple implications. Another advantage is power efficiency. SIGOVER does not require a strong power because the attack signal only needs to be higher enough to cover the original signal, called capture effect. It shows 98% success rate on 3 dB higher power than the legitimate base station. However, the FVS requires much stronger power than the SIGOVER. This is because the FVS needs to break the current connection between the victim UE and the legitimate base station. Next, I'll talk about what we can do with SIGOVER and broadcast messages. 
I have explained that there is no connection between the victim UE and the SIG over attacker. It means that the UE keeps communicating with the legitimate base station or network during the attack. For example, the SIG over can inject a malicious message while the UE is on phone. However, the UE cannot communicate with the network after attaching to the FPS. So, the UE might fall in the denial of services. Let me show you some possible attacks using SIG over, but not feasible using FBS. First one is signaling storm attack. In general, signaling storm occurs through a bonnet, but the SIG over can launch the attack without using the bonnet. The SIG over exploits a broadcast message called SIB1, especially the tracking area code. By changing the tracking area code to new one, the attacker can trigger tracking area update procedure of the victim UE, which is sent to the core network. All UEs in the attack range may continuously receive fake SIB1, which cause tracking area update storm to the core network. FPS can do the same, but as you expected, the legitimate network would be safe from this attack because the FPS is not connected to the legitimate core network. This is the demonstration of signaling storm. The program in this screen shows signaling messages of the UE. First, the attacker injects a malicious paging message. This malicious paging message is required for the UE to receive a new SIV1. Then, the attacker overshadows a malicious SIV1 message. Then, the UE generates signaling to the network. We evaluated amplification factor of signaling storm attack. In normal situation, a UE send about 45 service request message corresponding to over 600 signaling messages per hour. Signaling storm using SIG over can generate around 21,000 tracking area update requests corresponding to around 400,000 signaling messages per hour. In summary, signaling storm can generate 640 times more signaling messages per UE. The second is a selective DOS attack using SIB2. In SIB2, there is a field to prevent access of the UE for effective data service in a disaster situation. If we manipulate the, this field, we can prevent UEs from sending service requests to the base station. Of course, we can also adjust the bearing time. Furthermore, in the recent specification, bearing service is not only divided into signaling and data, but also divided into details such as voice call, video call, and SMS. Therefore, selective dose is possible. For example, all other services are possible, but only voice service is not available. The selective DOS attack was verified by Galaxy S9 and succeed. This attack is also only possible with SIG over. Even if the UE connects to the FPS and receives the wrong SIB2, the FPS cannot make this attack because the normal SIB2 is received again when the UE is connected to the normal base station again. This is the demonstration. It would be nice to show a video of selective dose, but not ready. So this video is a dose attack using access varying. The UEs can use normal data services and also voice calls. Okay, 
after the Seagull World Attack by the Yui. Victim Yui's receives malicious paging and SIP2 messages. And then the Yui normal service is now available. Even after the attacker program is terminated, the normal service is now available too. Okay, the following is an attack using NG paging. In the figure on the left, a UE that is normally attached is released in the idle state by releasing radio connection when not using LT data. At this time, if there is a service request for the UE from the networks, the base station sends a broadcast message paging to inform the UE. The identifier used at this time is a temporary ID of the UE called GUTI. However, if paging is sent using the unique ID of the UE called MZ, the UE will disconnect and reattach according to the behavior defined in the standard. This allows a DOS attack on the UE that is using the LT service. This is MG paging demo. This is our test bed setup. There is AutoCars PC and USRP. <coughs> Victim UE receives the voice call. The AutoCar inject a paging message with the victim's MG. Due to the image paging, the voice call is disconnected. The final attack I will introduce is a fake emergency alert attack. This attack uses SIV-12, which is used for alert systems. In normal networks, the process of using CMOS is as follows. Three messages, SIV-1, SIV-12, and paging, are involved in CMOS process. Based on this process, the attacker overshadows the SIV1, SIV12, and paging messages. For attack, victim phones connected to the legitimate base station and attacker synchronizes time and frequency with the legitimate base station. <coughs> this is fake emergency alert message. To sum up briefly, we have designed and implemented a signal overshadowing attack using the fundamental weakness of wireless communication. The signal over attack is more powerful than the FPS attack in terms of power efficiency and the connection between the UE and the normal base station and can perform more various attacks. <coughs> As an example, I showed demonstrations of four attacks then what can you do with a unique cast injection attack? The answer of this question will be explained in detail by Churchun. Hi again, and thank you, Minchul. So, as Minchul said, uh, what else can we do with the unique cast SIG over injection attack? So, when we go back to the fake base station attack, 
there have been various attacks using fake base station. As an example of an existing FBS attack, main the middle attack can be used for injecting, sealing, or eavesdropping victims' information. If the fake base station is not an LTE base station, but a 3G or 2G base station, it attacker can cause a greater damage to the victim's privacy. But actually, these attacks are quite limited to use. These attacks all assume that the victim is already connected to the fake base station. But in a static situation, in order for a UE to pass over to the fake base station, the fake base station signal must be about 40 dB, or 10,000 times larger than the commercial one. This is because the fake base station need to break the current connection between victim UE and legitimate base station. Operating fake base station with a strong signal requires a lot of resources and increases the chance to be detected. However, Seagover can solve these limitations. By injecting unicast message, attacker can force victim to attach to the fake base station. So, once the unicast message, the RRC connection release message, is message delivered by the base station to the UE. It is used to command the release of an RRC connection. So, when the UE receives this message, it will disconnect from the existing connection. And plus, unicast messages can have additional fields. One of the additional fields, the redirected carrier info field, is used to indicate the next frequency where the UE shall connect to. UE uses this information to select an acceptable base station to camp on. Also, the redirected frequency can be not only for LTE base stations, but also for 3G or 2G base station, which is more vulnerable. And the another additional field is idle mode mobility control info field. This field is used to, to provide dedicated cell selection, reselection priorities. When the UE searches for the base station, it does not check all the frequencies. Instead, it checks only selected frequencies based on frequency previously connected or frequency received from the network. So we noticed that when the UE is redirected to a non-searching frequency, UE did not redirect it to that frequency. However, when a non-searching non frequency was included in the idle mode mobility control info field, UE was redirected well even though it was a new frequency. The figure actually shows that the UE is redirected to another base station after receiving an RRC connection release message with a redirected carry info field and idle mode mobility control info field. You can see that the radio frequency channel number representing the communication frequency of the base station has changed from 100 to 2600. So, if attacker can inject this message to the victim UE, attacker can force victim UE to move to the fake base station. In order to inject this RC connection release message, injected messages should be decoded on the UE. To do this, more efforts are required than when injecting a broadcast message. Firstly, when injecting broadcast message, attacker only had to consider base station's configuration to inject the message. But to inject the unicast message, attacker also have to consider only additional information like UE's ID, RNTI, which is a temporary identifier, sequence number, message format, and so on. Moreover, the message must be set correctly in the right place. UE does not decode all the messages over the air, but only decodes what it needs to decode. The location of the broadcast message is common space and every UE have to decode the message on the common space. But the location of the unicast message is a UE-specific space, and 
it is determined according to the RNTI. So the message should be decoded at the UE specific space. With these extra efforts, unicast messages can also be injected via Seagover. Now, I will introduce attack scenarios using RRC connection release message injection. In this attack, the attacker is assumed to know the IMSI or RNTI of the victim. We also assume that an attacker is located where he can hear signals from legitimate base station, such as victim UE. Attack scenarios can be divided into two. First situation is when there is a vulnerability on the device. In this case, attacker needs to know IMSI or RNTI. If the victim UE has the vulnerability that accepts security unprotected message even after the security activation, attacker can easily inject the unicast message. We could find this vulnerability while developing methods to test device's vulnerability. Second situation is when there is no vulnerability on the device. In this case, attacker needs to know the IMZ. Then, attacker needs to inject message before the security activation. For this attack, there need additional technical implementations. Actually, this implementation is in progress. Now, the first scenario is when there is a vulnerability in the UE. This UE has a vulnerability that receives unprotected messages even in the presence of a security context. The victim UE is now connected to the legitimate network and has finished the security process. So the victim UE has a security context and it is using normal cellular service. Then the attacker injects an unprotected RC connection release message on the UE. Due to the vulnerability, the UE accepts security unprotected RC connection release message. Then the UE disconnects the existing connection and is redirected to the attacker's fake base station and requests for the connection. The second scenario is when there is no vulnerability on the UE. The victim UE is now connected to the legitimate network and ha has finished the security process. So the victim UE has a security context and it only accepts security protected messages. Thus, attacker cannot inject messages for now. So attacker must delete the user UE's security context in order for the victim to receive an attacker's unprotected messages. To do this, the attacker injects a MG paging message. According to the 3GPP specification, when UE receives the MG paging message, it should immediately terminate all service sessions, delete parameters including security key. So by injecting MG paging message, attacker can delete the security context of the victim. After UE terminates the existing connection, it starts over the attached procedure with the base station. Before the victim UE finishes the security procedure, the attacker injects an RC connection release message. When there is no security context, UE is allowed to receive the security unprotected RC connection release message. Therefore, the UE processes the attacker's message and sends a connection request to the attacker's fake base station. So far, we have introduced attacks that brings target victims to the fake base stations. But existing fake base station attack can bring all the unspecified UEs to it. From an FES attacker's point of view, it may be easier and better to attach all the UE around. Then we need to know if the Seagover attack can do the same thing. In this attack, 
the attacker constantly monitors downlink messages from the commercial base station to acquire RNTI from RC connection setup message. Once the attacker gets the RNTI, attacker injects the RC connection release message. Attacker can repeat the entire process until he brings the, all the UEs around. To verify this attack, we used Galaxy S4. The Galaxy S4 is the one of the vulnerable device that receives an unprotected message even in the presence of a security context. This vulnerability was discovered while studying methods to test devices' vulnerability. In this case, we could inject an RC connection release message to the UE without deleting the security context. To inject the RC connection release message, we used free open source LTE software, SRS LTE, and USRP X310. When the UE is normally connected to the cellular network, we injected crafted message to redirect the victim UE to the attacker's fake base station's frequency 363. The injected message contains the redirected carrier info field and idle mode mobility control info field. The redirected carrier info field is set to the LT frequency type and contains 363, the frequency of fake base station. The idle mode mobility control info field contains a list of normal base station's frequency and an attacker's frequency. At this time, the priority of attacker's frequency is set to the highest to ensure that the victim definitely passes over the fake base station. Here is the demonstration of the attack. So at the first time, the victim's phone is connected to the legitimate base station 100, and attacker is operating fake base station 363. Then attacker injects the message. And you, as you can, you could see at the monitor, the signal was injected. And the injected message has the contents of as follows. And this is same with what I said before. And then, as you can see at the fake base station's monitor, the victim's phone is connected to the fake base station. And if you see the packets during the attack, the, that one is the injected message. After that, victim's phone makes a new connection with the fake base station. So it moves from 100 to the 363. So after this attack, we could do anything like main the middle attack and so on. So in the previ previous demo, the victim UE was connected to a commercial base station and then moved to a fake base station that had never been connected. Let's sum up the fake base station attack using Seagover. First, this attack requires much less power and is easier than the traditional fake base station attacks. As a result, the chance to be detected decreases and the effective attack range increases. Second, the attacker can choose victim to move to the fake base station. Since the attacker injects a unicast message, only the targeted UE is affected. Therefore, the chance to be detected also reduced and it allows the attacker to definitely force the target to attach to a fake base station. Finally, the attacker's fake base station can be not only LTE base station, but also a 3G or 2G base station. As the 3G or 2G base stations are more vulnerable, attacker can perform more severe attacks. And now I'm going to talk about some countermeasures, discussion, conclusion, and future works. For future works, 
To make this attack possible for all the UEs, actually, additional implementations are needed. First, it should be implemented to find out the RNTI of the victim using IMZ. An attacker can do this by monitoring the RC connection setup message after sending the IMG paging. Actually, it is already possible, but it must be optimized with injecting techniques in real time. Second, it should be implemented to inject message before the security process ends. To do this, there is a little time to inject messages, as you can see at the figure, Hardware optimizations are necessary. Although there are some things that need to be implemented, we expect that this attack will be possible on every UE if the hardware is fully optimized. And for the countermeasures of, for this attack, the secure solution against SIG over attack on the message is to use digital signature. Currently, only a single injected message can cause a long-term denial of service. Once the message is protected with a digital signal, a signature, it, mo it can prevent the attacks introduced so far. Plus, the attack cost would be increased. This is because the attacker have to inject wrong message continuously to cause denial of service in the presence of the digital signature. Moreover, it becomes possible to detect the presence of the attack. Actually, this is possible because from the 5G, operator's public key will be stored in the USIM. In fact, 3GPP is recently studying the FPS problem and lack of integrity protection of broadcasting information. And since Hojun first published the Sigover attack on broadcast message in Last August, we have received many requests to request a release the code, attack code as an open source. However, we have some reasons that we can't. First reason is that according to the GSMA, an organization for cellular carriers said the GSMA have no objection to any security research being open sourced where there is a clear security benefit, and there is no risk posed to innocent users. Releasing this code clearly has some security benefits. However, unfortunately, the proposed attack can affect a large number of innocent users around. So it might be hard to release the attack code. And another reason is the quality of the code. Thank you. <laughs> Currently, uh, the code we made is not well organized to make it open source. In conclusion, we presented SIG over attack, physically overwriting specific subframes. SIG over is a new exploit on unpatched and insecure channel on LTE network. Comparing to attacks using fake face stations, Seekover is way cheaper and stealthier. Also, we found new attacks on physical channel. By injecting broadcast messages, we could cause denial of service, access barring, signaling storm, and fake emergency alerts. And by injecting unicast message, we could force targeted victim to move to the fake base station. Finally, I expect the Seekover attack will be used in the wild. Therefore, not only cellular networks, but all the systems based on the cellular networks, such as vehicle to everything, can be affected. In the future, mobile communication technologies such as 5G and 6G are developed. So, more secure systems should be made by considering the security of the physical layer, which was not considered before. Therefore, I strongly suggest 3GPP to use digital signatures for physical channel, despite its difficulty. Thank you. And for the last, we have responsibly disclosed these attacks to the GSMA and Qualcomm. 
Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, please let us know. And if you have any uh, long questions, please email us through the emails on the slide. And the photo is our lab's photo. And my supervisor is Yongde Kim. Maybe some of you would have heard about him because he's doing a lot of researches about security. So anyway, thank you. All right. Thanks, you two, so far. We have uh, around 10 minutes for questions. So if you have a questions for the speakers, please go to one of the room mics, and we'll uh, for let you ask your question. Do we already have people lined up? Let's start with a question from the signal angel. Uh, there's one question. Are these methods similar or the same used by law enforcement? And the user mentioned uh, Stingray for an example. Uh, pardon, please. Uh, where, where are you? Can you raise your hands? I can. Ah, okay. Hi. Can you can you it's say that? It's a question okay? from the internet. So, yeah. um, are these methods similar or the same used by the law enforcement? Law enforcement. Police. Yeah, maybe. It might be possible, but actually, it is, as I know, uh, using the frequency that legitimate basis stations is already like illegal to use. So, I think that cannot be the solution. All right, I actually don't see anybody yet. Oh, there is one at uh, mic three, please. Yes, so you show a subframe when you replace it. Why can't you hash the value for integrity? So the replacements will be kind of hard to do. Maybe that also can be a problem and solution, but using hash, right? RC probably. Uh, so just to check some the full frame. Yeah. So if you replace a subframe, the hash should be invalid. Yeah, but that can be a solution. But I think we have to think about how to uh, connect a, a secure connection at the first time if we don't have anything between like UE and the network. Maybe sending some hash also would be challenge. Maybe. Is that can be a solution to your question? Yeah, so I'm not sure if I understood. So in your attack, you have, let's say, 10 frames. Can you replace subframe two, right? Yep. Yeah, so if all the 10 frames will be hashed, your replacement will be detected. Is it possible on uh, LTE level? to change the standard to have some hashing or integrity. Yeah, maybe that will be possible, but I think uh, we need another way to uh, transfer the hash value to check the connection. But I think that can be also be another solution. All right, let's go to Mike one then. Um, I would like to know if you, uh, what your personal opinion and feeling is, um, if this will be mitigated by the vendors and the standard bodies. I mean, will they fix it? Uh, in the future, right? Of course, in the future. They cannot fix it in the past, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, maybe, uh, as I said before, uh, like GSMA is already like, considering these attacks. And they have some regular meetings. Maybe the last meeting was in Nevada in November. And maybe in the future, they will. But not for now, so maybe we have to ask if there is any person from 3GPP. OK, okay all right, thanks. Uh, does the Signal Angel have any other questions? No. Then I think this concludes the questions and answer section. Thanks again. Thank you.